Awesome. So we uh, now, I hope you help me all bring to the stage Phil Dow, who is a machine learning engineer at Doc AI. Um, and he's going to bring us some stuff on the, uh, a talk, excuse me, some stuff on uh, the work that Doc AI is doing on federated learning in healthcare, which is going to be, um, I know is a topic that's going, it's pretty hot this year at the conference. And I know I'm certainly excited to see it. So um, we'll just give ourselves a hot second to get set up here. Great. Looks All set. Good. We're getting there. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> set up. Great. And the, is, uh, the clicker, the clicker should, try should be all set. Great. Fantastic. Let Phil take it away. Great. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you so much. Hi. Uh, my name is Philip Dow. I'm a machine learning engineer at Doc AI, and this is Federated Learning in Healthcare. I want to thank my colleagues for their help in preparing this talk. Although I'm up here giving the presentation, this has definitely been a team effort. So thank you, everyone at Doc AI. All right, we'll start by distinguishing the federated workflow from a more conventional machine learning workflow. Then we'll look at the two kinds of federated learning that we're doing at Doc AI, horizontal learning and vertical learning, and see how we apply them to medical information. And then we'll wrap up by addressing some of the theoretical challenges that we face whenever we're doing any kind of federated learning. All right, in a conventional machine learning workflow, once you've identified your learning task, you're going to centrally collect the data that you want to train your model on, centrally train the model, and then when you're satisfied with the results, deploy that model for inference. Now, the key feature here is that you're centrally collecting that data and centrally training the model. Even when you do this in a distributed manner, you're still centrally collecting that data to some repository beforehand and training from there. In a federated workflow, on the other hand, We'll start with a base model, which may have been trained in this conventional manner. But once we have that base model, we're no longer going to centrally collect any data or centrally train the model. Instead, we're going to send that model to multiple devices, train on the data on those devices to produce a number of local updates to the model, and then aggregate those local updates into a new global model, which becomes the base model for our next round of training and inference in what's called the federated loop. And again, the key point here being that we're no longer centrally collecting data or centrally training our model. We're going to be sending our model to the data. So to distinguish the two, centralized data collection and centralized training in a conventional setup, even if you're doing this in a distributed manner, whereas in the federated workflow, we have decentralized data and federated training. And one way to think about this that's kind of easy is to say, instead of bringing the data to the model, we're going to send the model to the data. Now, this presents some interesting theoretical, engineering, and architectural challenges, which we'll be addressing in this talk. But why would we want to do this? So at Doc AI, we work with medical data, and there are a number of issues around data sensitivity that we need to address, issues which restrict access to training data. That includes, from an individual's perspective, issues around privacy and trust, where consumers are understandably reluctant to share their medical information. From a business perspective, there are issues around intellectual property and internal data policies where companies want to collaborate with other companies as well as internally, but cannot do so because of these restrictions. Um, and then, of course, we have regulatory concerns that we also need to address, particularly the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act in the United States and the general data protection regulations in the Eurozone. And what we found is that federated learning is a viable approach to machine learning in these contexts where there is restricted access to training data. Um, so uh, dealing with these data sensitivity issues. OK, we're doing two kinds of federated learning here at Doc AI, horizontal learning and vertical learning, which are distinguished primarily in how they handle differences in the sample space and feature space of their respective data sets. So in horizontal learning, we have a different sample space, but the same feature space. Whereas in vertical learning, we're going to share the sample space, but have a different feature space. And we found that horizontal learning roughly corresponds to learning in a mobile environment where we can fully share a model, whereas vertical learning roughly corresponds to learning in a cloud environment where we can only partially share a model. We'll see what that means here more in a moment, but first let's clarify this a bit. So imagine you have a table of data with samples across rows and features down columns like you would see in a matrix prior to sending into a neural network or just even in a SQL table. In horizontal learning, we're going to split this data set horizontally. So now each subset of the data has access to the same feature space, but a different sample space. So imagine you want to train a model on a number of mo mobile phones, an image model. 
You're going to be sending in a 224 by 224 RGB pixel buffer into that model, so it's the same feature space, but it's different images on each phone, so it's a different sample space. We'll start with a global model, send it to each device, train it locally on each device to produce a number of local updates, and then aggregate those local updates into a new global model. Now, with vertical learning, on the other hand, we'll split this data set vertically. Now, again, we're sharing the sample space, but we have a different feature space. So you can imagine patient records, where we have radiological information in one data repository and prescription drug information in another, maybe in the form of natural language. So now we have information for the same patient, so it's the same feature space, but clearly we have two very different kinds of features in both repositories. What we're going to do here is train two separate models and then somehow combine them into a shared model that performs better than a model trained on either data set independently. And we'll see what le that looks like here in a moment, but first let's take a closer look at horizontal learning. So we do this in the context of a mobile environment at DocAI. We call it Federated Mobile. And for our example, we'll use the medical selfie. So the medical selfie is a model we've developed at DocAI, which infers your age, sex, height, and weight from an image of your face. We use that to calculate your BMI, your body mass index, which becomes a data point in additional healthcare statistics. Now we want to train this model in a federated manner. So we'll start with our base model, which we've previously trained on millions of images, trained in a conventional manner. But then that, from that point on, we're no longer going to centrally collect any user data. We're not going to collect any user data at all. Instead, we're going to send that model to device where it's going to first perform inference on new selfies. Individuals will have the opportunity to correct those inferences, so correct their age, sex, height, and weight. And then we're going to train the model on those devices on that corrected data. This will produce a number of local updates to the model, which will then again aggregate into a new global model and repeat that process. Now, the averaging or the aggregation algorithm that we use for this is called federated averaging. It's a simple weighted average of the local updates to the model, weighted according to the number of samples that were used to produce that update. So it's a fairly straightforward process here. In fact, from a machine learning perspective, setting aside some theoretical concerns, which we'll address towards the end of the topic, and particularly from an architectural perspective, this entire process is actually fairly straightforward. So we're beginning with a conventional convolutional model, a MobileNet v2 model specifically. We use transfer learning, so it's been trained on the ImageNet classification data set. We add custom layers to the end of the model, train it all the way through, send it to device, and then perform this simple weighted average to bring everything together. So the challenges that we face when doing this kind of learning, this kind of horizontal learning, are more from an engineering perspective. So we're dealing with issues around asynchronous task management. Clients are making multiple requests to a server for training tasks, and the server needs to manage those tasks. It needs to manage aggregation whenever we complete a federated training round. Clients may make, uh, participate in a round more than once or not at all. Some clients will be training a model while other clients are still making requests and so on. So we need to manage that. We're dealing with mobile device constraint issues. So as you can imagine, performing training on a mobile phone is a resource-intensive process. And we want to make sure maybe that the device is plugged in, that it has a Wi-Fi connection, that the user isn't using it, and so on. Um, and then finally, of course, there are networking issues. As in any system like this, we're dealing with latency, drop connections, and so on. Um, our model, unquantize, is about 20 megabytes, so four to five million floating point parameters. And we want to make sure we're not sending that over a cell phone connection too often. So a lot of engineering challenges here. Um, again, there are some theoretical challenges, but we'll look at those towards the end of the topic, or end of the talk. So the big question is, does this work? So what we're looking at here is a graph of the local losses versus the global training loss for a binary classification model that we employed, uh, deployed internally at DocAI. And hopefully you can see there's a red dot there off to the left, right in between 0, 0.0 and 0, 0.5, that represents the loss of our base model prior to being sent to devices for training. So this is our original model that we've trained offline. And then we're seeing the number of gray dots here, which represent the local losses being reported back by devices after they've conducted local training. And we see one of two things happening here, really. Either that local loss is exploding off to the right, suggesting that something has gone very wrong with training, um, or the local loss is very quickly going towards zero, which suggests that we're overfitting our local training data. And in fact, we see that reflected in our accuracies. So once again, that red dot represents the accuracy of our base model, our global model prior to federation. 
It has an accuracy of about 90% on this binary classification problem. And those gray dots represent the accuracies of the local updates prior to aggregation. So they've been reported back to our server, and we're checking their accuracy on the holdout validation data set. And you can see we get accuracies in this 40 to 60% range, suggesting no better than a coin flip on a binary classification problem. Um, again, we believe this is because we're just very quickly overfitting a small sample size of local training data on each device. But, so here's the exciting part. When we perform federated averaging on those models, we actually end up with a model that is slightly better than the original. And that's that blue dot that just appeared off to the right, just barely to the right of that red dot. So let me repeat that. We're able to average worse models and get a better model. Okay, that's extraordinarily counterintuitive, so let's see if we can develop an intuition for why that might be the case. Imagine a very simple model in two-dimensional space where we have an excellent decision boundary separating our lovely gray dots from black dots, and we're going to train this model on a couple of devices. In that top case, I've added two yellow dots at the bottom right representing new gray dots, and training is pulling that decision boundary in that direction. Whereas in the bottom case, I've added some purple dots up in the top left, representing new black dots, and training, again, is pulling the decision boundary off in that direction. So we end up with two models that actually perform worse than the original model. They're misclassifying a number of the original samples. But when we perform averaging on that decision boundary, which is to say we perform averaging on the weights that represent that decision boundary, we end up with a model closer to the original one, which is, again, correctly classifying all of our samples. Now, this is happening in very high dimensional space, four to five million parameters for a mobile net model, um, but hopefully this helps develop an intuition for why this might work. Okay, so that's horizontal learning. Now let's talk about vertical learning, which we do in the context of the cloud, so we call it vertical cloud, or excuse me, federated cloud. Um, this is an area of very active research at DocAI where we think we're starting to make some original contributions, so I'm super excited to be sharing this with you today. Um, and I want to, in particular, thank my colleague James for his contributions here. Recall that in vertical learning, we're partitioning our data set vertically. So again, we're going to share a sample space across a number of systems, but we have different features in each one of those systems. And we need to train some kind of, or two independent models that will somehow be shared to produce a better model. Now we're facing some architectural challenges in addition to the, the same engineering challenges that we have. What is a model, or what do multiple models that are somehow shared look like that can accomplish this? And remember, we can't share any of the raw data. So keep in mind, we're building two models here, one on each system. Our models are going to start with an encoder network. So these encoders can be tailored to the kinds of data that they're dealing with, so they're a subset of that feature space. In our example, in the first system, we had radiological information, so maybe we have a convolutional model. Well, in the second system, we had prescription drug information in the form of natural language, so maybe we have a recurrent network that's performing these encodings. We're going to create two encodings from those, uh, from those two data systems, and then we'll share those encod encodings across these two networks and concatenate them sample-wise. We'll take those shared codings and send them into a deeper part of the network. Now, we still have two separate networks here, but these networks are now sharing the same architecture in this deeper portion. We may, they, so they should produce the same outputs. They're receiving the same encoder inputs. But we may have initialized them with different random weights. So after the backwards pass, we're going to average the weights in that deeper portion of the network so that they eventually converge towards the same values. And now what we effectively have are private encoders, but a shared output layer or shared output system. Um, and now we'll see in our federated loop that things are a little bit tighter. So we'll send our samples, uh, excuse me, we'll send batches of samples row-wise into these two networks, each with access only to the data in its respective feature space, produce our encodings, perform the output, run the backwards pass, average the weights, and then take another batch and do that. And each one of these represents a round in our federated loop now. So our federated loop is a little bit tighter. And what we found with this architecture is that we achieve results that are comparable to what we see in a more conventional machine learning architecture. So what we're looking at here are the results of four models being run on a federated data set, data sets A and B, where we have a classification problem that needs information from both data sets to produce an accurate result. We train two models, models on each data set independently. Those are represented by the blue and green lines at the bottom. They never achieve very good accuracy because, again, we need information from both data sets. 
We've also trained a conventional model, so one that has access to both data sets simultaneously. It's the gray, uh, gray line at the top that's uh, kind of hidden by that red one, but it represents our non-federated model and it achieves an accuracy in this 90 to 92 percent uh, range. And again, this is on a test data set. And then finally, we have our federated model that uses the architecture I just described. It's represented by that red line there, and it achieves an accuracy quite close to what we see with a non-federated architecture. So we're off by a couple of percentage points. So clearly, there's a trade-off here. We're using encoding, so we're losing some information. But we get an accuracy that is fairly close to a model that would have access to the entire data. So in the case of vertical learning, as is the case of horizontal learning in a mobile context, we're able to conclude that we can get pretty decent results with a federated approach. Okay, there's a couple of properties worth mentioning about this architecture. Notice that we don't need to share any information about the raw data. The two systems have, don't have to share any of that information, not the data schemas, not their internal distributions, nothing. All we have to share are those encodings. That also means that we don't have to share any information about the respective encoders. Those are architectures that remain entirely private to those systems. Again, we get results that are comparable to non-federated training. Um, and then it's worth mentioning that training here is happening synchronously, whereas it's happening asynchronously in the mobile context. So in the mobile context, clients are coming in and out. Training rounds can start on a client without having to wait for other training rounds on other clients to finish. Here, we need to perform that training in parallel on each of those systems, because we need those encodings as part of the forward pass before we can send them into the deeper part of the network. And then we need to perform the backwards pass and average those weights before we can take the next batch of samples. So all that needs to be happening together. So there's some uh, synchronization issues that we're dealing with. All right, so that's horizontal learning and vertical learning and how we're applying it to medical information at Doc AI. Now I want to look at a couple of the theoretical challenges that we need to address. And the theoretical challenge that we must answer is that we can no longer guarantee that training data is independent and identically distributed. This is what distinguishes any federated learning from more conventional machine learning and is the loss of that strong statistical guarantee that our model will generalize well to a population that we're supposedly sampling our training data from. So we may no longer have the same populations that we're sampling training data from when we send a model to multiple mobile phones or the broader population of training data may not match the population that we want to perform inference on at all. So we lose that statistical guarantee. Let's look at the medical selfie again to see an example of what this looks like. So we've trained this model originally on selfies. We want to perform inference on selfies. We want to send it to mobile phones and train it on more selfies. So our population is any selfie you can take on a mobile phone, let's say. But when we send this, or send this model to mobile phones for training, we're potentially exposing it to any image that you can take with a mobile camera. So that means that we're no longer just getting selfies. People might be taking pictures of kittens and telling us that they're 40 years old, or sunsets and that they weigh 150 kilograms. We have fully lost control of the training data, which means that we cannot guarantee that this model will generalize well. Our training population does not match our population for inference. We must address this problem. We're doing it in two ways. So we put filters in front of and behind the model with the goal of constraining that population of training data or that we're sampling our training data from so that it more closely matches our population, our target population for inference. Now the, the filter in front of the model is fairly straightforward. We want to train this model on selfies. We're potentially exposing it to any image you can take on a phone. So let's put a face detector in front of it. Now, again, we're constraining that population that we're sampling our training data from so that it more closely matches our target population for inference. It's not going to be perfect. Our face detector may not be 100% accurate. And then we also might let images through that have faces in them, but which aren't selfies. So we're also going to put a filter on the back side of the model. So now imagine we've trained a model and we're getting ready to aggregate it into a new global model. Well, recall our graph of local losses versus global training losses, where in some cases, our loss explodes off to the right. That suggests that something has gone wrong with training, something very wrong with training. In fact, maybe we're getting data from a population that doesn't match our target population from which we sampled our original training data and that we want to perform inference on. So we're going to filter those updates to the model out and not include them in our aggregation. We can think of this as a proxy for malformed decision boundaries. When the loss is exploded off to the right like that, we've probably jumped out of the local minima we originally discovered, and now we have some really gnarly decision boundaries. Again, we want to threshold those models out. 
So what we're going to take is the distance of the weights for, of the local update to the original model, and then maybe relative to the total distribution of weights of the local updates or their distance to the original model, we'll threshold out the extreme values. Um, and again, our hope here is that we're better constraining of the population that we're taking this training data from so that it matches the, our target population for inference. And what we found when we do this, both here at DocAI in the research that we're reading and what's being reported by larger companies, is that we get empirical results that are very good. So despite the loss of that strong statistical guarantee, and as long as we're taking some uh, steps to mitigate it, we get results that work. Now, this is dependent on client size, sample size. Of course, the more training data you have, the better, um, as well as additional hyperparameters, like the number of epochs that we're training on each device, the filters, and so on. But we're able to affirm that federated learning works, even with the loss of that strong statistical guarantee. OK. Uh, the second theoretical challenge I want to briefly mention, uh, just briefly due to ki time constraints, concerns the kinds of privacy guarantees that we can make. So is federation good enough, or are we leaking some information about the training data? We must be able to answer that question if we say we're addressing privacy. And the three approaches that we're looking at here at DocAI are differential privacy, homomorphic encryption, and some information theoretic questions. Uh, so differential privacy is the practice of adding noise to a statistic to mask its true value. Research has shown that we can apply this technique in both non-federated and federated contexts to mask the participation of a sample or even an entire client in a training round. Homomorphic encryption is a kind of encryption that allows us to perform a series of computations on a ciphertext and then get the same decrypted results as if we had performed that, those series of computations on the original text. My understanding is that this only works with linear transformations, so there are some restrictions here, but it offers an extremely strong privacy guarantee, so it's something we're actively looking at. Um, and then finally, there are some information theoretic questions that we want to ask. So especially in the case of vertical learning, where our encoders are effectively performing a dimensionality reduction on the original data, we want to know how much information can we recover about that original data from those encodings. OK. So we've looked at the federated workflow and seen how it's different from a more conventional machine learning workflow. Specifically, instead of centrally collecting data and centrally training a model, we have decentralized data and federated training. We've looked at the two kinds of uh, federated learning we're doing here at DocAI, horizontal learning and vertical learning, and seeing how we apply them to medical data. And again, they differ in how they handle uh, the feature space and sample space of their respective data sets. And then we've looked at some of the theoretical challenges that we face, specifically questions around our training distributions and the kinds of privacy guarantees that we, we can make. And we have been able to conclude that federated learning is a viable approach to machine learning, particularly in the healthcare space where there are issues around data sensitivity that restrict our access to training data. Okay, uh, my name was Philip Dow. Again, I'm a machine learning engineer at DocAI. This was federated learning in healthcare. If you have any questions about this talk or uh, you'd like to discuss it or maybe work on some of these problems, we will be on the Xflow 4 uh, for the entire session. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, hey, let's give a round of applause for all our speakers this morning. Thank you to everybody who did speak. Uh, some exciting ideas, um, some great, uh, some great uh, sort of cutting edge thinking there. Um, we are going to take a break for lunch. Um, our program will resume at 1.35. Um, and we have some really exciting stuff this afternoon. So please come back, tell your friends, uh, go see some demos, and enjoy your break.